yourself. So Joe's here to share with us some of the information, some of the insights from Michigan. Uh, we're going to follow that with an open sort of researcher's dialogue. So Michael Barber and myself will be here and very informal in terms of how we want to do this. Uh, in terms of the discussions, we'll tell you a little bit more about it. But we really want to serve your interests and answer the questions and identify some of the things that need further exploration for yourselves, in specifically in Ontario, as well as what you can take back to other jurisdictions as well. So, without further ado, Joan, tell us a little bit about Lessons from Michigan. Very excited to be here. I think we're going to have a really wonderful day and a lot of chance to interact and to learn from each other and, and uh, come up with some action items of how we might move forward. Let me share a little bit more about myself. I uh, used to be a high school English teacher. I retired from that. Uh, I went and got my PhD in educational technologies and educational psychology from Michigan State University. And for over a decade now, I've been working at Michigan Virtual in the field of K-12 online learning. And uh, I feel really uh, honored and fortunate to work for the company I do because there's really not another group I can think of that does what we do. We do really three things at Michigan Virtual. We run a supplemental or you might call a part-time online learning program for students. This past year, we had over 30,000 enrollments that we produced and, and since our inception in 2000 really with that program, we've had over uh, 250,000 enrollments that provided to the, to the state of Michigan online in the supplemental context. So we're, we're a big provider in that space. Another part of our, our organization does professional learning. So for educators, administrators, bus drivers, you name it, we provide online professional learning and some face-to-face -face professional learning. This past year we had over 56,000 enrollments in our online programs for, for professional learning. And then what really makes us unique is that Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute. We have a, a group of researchers that look at best practices, cutting edge research, data for, uh, policy efforts, and we, we play a very kind of qualitative or quality assurance process in the state of Michigan. All three of those are housed within this nonprofit organization that we've been very fortunate to get state appropriations for about the last, uh, well, since 1998, to be able to continue to do this work on behalf of Michigan's education system. We are not a school, we are not part of the system, because we are asked to try to kind of make change and help move that system along. And at, at the inception, it was felt like if we were inside, that would be a challenge. So we're very unique in the way we're set up and the way we're funded. Um, to give you an example of our size, uh, we have about 116, 117 full-time people who work for our organization. We have another 100 and probably close to 70 now who teach part-time for our organization, so we're, we're relatively large. Um, and I think it gives us a, a really neat perspective on a variety of domains that are going to be important to conversations today. Uh, let me just talk, I'm going to kind of just lay the land of where I want to go uh, with today's session. The first thing we're going to talk about is, I, I want to give you some context about Michigan's different policies. There's really two policies I think you need to be aware of and just kind of walking around the room. I know some people can understand Michigan has mandatory e-learning. That's true. I'm going to probably change the way you think about what that actually means. And then we're going to talk about a more recent policy, which is what we call 21F, or if you're familiar with course access, we're going to talk about that policy. And I, the reason I want to spend a little bit of time in there is because I think the lessons that I'm going to share later, uh, which is my other piece here, I'm going to offer 10 lessons that I think might be worthwhile for us to consider, lessons from Michigan to offer to Ontario and to Canada in general. Uh, I think you need to understand that context, but also, uh, as you're thinking very specifically about your legislation, looking at other examples might help you think about ideas and pieces that could be part of what you guys would want to propose. So that's that's what I'm going to try to accomplish. I'm going to try to go rather broad because later on in the day, and, and even after this when we have some Q&A and in our breakout sessions, then hopefully that will be where we'll dive in more deeply and have that. But I'm going to, I'm going to try to set a really wide table for us. Um, so why this approach? I'm going to suggest there's a couple of things. Um, like I talked about this as setting a broad agenda. 
I want to make sure that you guys have a really rich set of resources when you leave here. So I've already provided Randy with the, um, the Google slide deck, and he'll be adding that to the uh, Summit Google site. So that all of you guys have this, it's pretty well annotated. There's lots of links, but the way I built this, this uh, talk is, I'm assuming you guys are mostly representatives, and you're gonna need to go back and have conversations with people in your schools, in your programs, and hopefully this slide deck will help you have that, those conversations and look at some really great resources. So we'll put all of that together for you. And then finally, oh, and, and that's the final one really, um, you're gonna have that deck. So don't worry about needing to take pictures of every slide. You'll, you'll have the best pictures you can get by getting the deck itself. So without that, I'm gonna talk about two online policies. The first was what you guys would probably think of as our mandatory e-learning policy that was part of the Michigan America curriculum that was passed in 2006. So we are more than a decade ahead, I guess, if you will, of where you guys are in considering um, some aspects of your mandatory e-learning policy. And the other one is much more recent. That was in 2013 with what we call Section 21F. And I'll get into more details of it, uh, each one of those. I, I want to talk about this in part, not because these are the same things you're going through, but you will probably be able to find parallels between what's happening in Canada and what, what we've gone through. So as an example, the online learning requirement in Michigan was not a standalone requirement. It was a part of a package of a complete curriculum redesign. It might sound familiar, right? A complete curriculum redesign with different kinds of requirements, four years of English, four years of mathematics, two years of foreign language, so on and so forth. One component of that entire change was the online learning experience. The rationale behind this entire policy, as you kind of look through it, was really about language. It was couched in language about getting ready for the global economy, making sure that our students that we are graduating are ready to participate in this new global economy that is being predicted in 2005 as we were getting ready and then adopted in 2006. So seeing that coming, that was the language that it was couched in. And the online learning uh, experience had its own kind of rationale put to it, but you're probably familiar with these kinds of things. It talked about career readiness, college readiness, lifelong learning, right? Those are kind of the, the language that it was sold on and said this is what we need to be able to do in order for our students who are graduating to be, to be ready in this global economy. Now, what you may not know is that there are really three different ways to satisfy our mandatory e-learning requirement. The first one on that list that you probably understand very easily, which is you can take an online course. That course, however, you know, in, in terms of how it might translate, I think it's a little bit different. That course is like a semester length half credit. So uh, like an 18 week course where it's just one hour a day, that's about the length that that is meant to be. Like if I understand the way your program is, you guys have about like eight times that level uh, in the consideration for four credit hours. Ours would just be considered a half credit hour. So you could take that, that course and that would satisfy the online learning experience. The second way that you can do it, and um, one that maybe needs a little bit more explanation, is what we call the, uh, is the an online experience. And uh, where's Frank? Frank, you talked yesterday about COM. Is that the right term? Okay, so you guys may be familiar with COM, but the, the concept here it was that uh, we want students to be familiar with, with some online. We want them to have an experience. We want that experience to be a minimum of 20 hours. And an example of something they were thinking around at that time was uh, like a career explorer tool where the students would go in, they would learn about different careers, they would create in some ways an educational pathway plan to help them figure out what courses they should be taking throughout uh, high school and, and then be able to put themselves on that track. And that was kind of generally conceived about the size of something that could satisfy this online learning experience. The third option and uh, that we'll see here is the, is the integration of that. There you go. The experience is being integrated into that Michigan Merit curriculum. So a few slides ago, you saw me show four years of English, four years of math, four years of one, all of those courses that were required for graduation. The third option was, if each of those courses had some online element to them, 
that in sum, across them, roughly represented 20 hours of content that and instruction that was delivered online, then that too would satisfy the online learning experience. Now here's the kicker, right? We just, this was passed in 2006, really the first graduating class, the way it worked for us is the graduating class of 2011 was the first one that had to go through that and have that requirement. I know we've had questions about, well, how's that going to work for you? Ours was basically, uh, class of 2011 was be the one that had to go through the online experience. I can tell you that still today, the state collects no data about how a student fulfills one of these three. So if you go out and you ask somebody, and, and the best one is to ask a, a recent graduate, they'll tell you they have no idea. And if you go to an administrative building, they won't, they won't really say much about it. This third one is basically the default. The integration, or here I use this term, kind of the blending of those online assets into the Michigan Parent Curriculum is the predominant model we believe in how this online experience is being uh, taken care of for students, but there's no audit on it. It's, it's more of just a low, we're very much a local control state, which is a bit different than some of those, I think the big centralized movements are here. But each of those schools basically just sign out and say, yeah, they did something in there. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing where it just really kind of lacks the teeth. But those three different flavors of it gives you a lot of different perspectives on, and any one of them could satisfy our mandatory e-learning requirement. 21F, How, are you guys familiar with course access or course choice? Have you heard of that language before? Okay. I got one head <laughs> All right. So let me, let me go into a little bit of background on that. Maybe I should say that Michigan Merit Curriculum that we adopted in 2006 was the very first mandatory learning, online learning requirement in, this, in the states, in the United States. Subsequently, other states have adopted mandatory uh, experiences, many of which are more stringent than Michigan's now, where they actually have to take a full course. They don't have some of the other uh, integrated options like you saw. But in 2013, Michigan became uh, maybe the third or fourth state in our, our nation that would allow course access or course choice. And the concept behind this was if a parent or a student wanted to take an online course, the law was behind them to be able to ask for that and receive that online course. It did not matter whether the local district offered that course face-to-face -face or whether they offered it online, that child and that parent could request the right to take that course online. There's a handful of reasons we'll get into about the denial. We did have some factors like it limited the scope to two courses per academic term, and most of our courses are, most of our uh, schools are on semesters, so they have like a fall term and a spring term. There's a handful that would be on trimesters, so they have like three of them, uh, but only two courses per academic term, unless the, the school and the parent thought it was in the best interest. And it had a grade level ban, so it allowed that to be in play You'll learn a little bit later that that was 5 through 12, and we subsequently rewrote it to be 6 through 12. But basically, um, your middle school, high school, your secondary curriculum, that was a, that was, uh, a new policy. And the, the focus of it is uh, school of choice. You guys have school of choice at all? Okay. So before this, in terms of our progression, where you lived dictated which schools you would attend. And after that, it kind of got uncoupled in, in kind of a choice concept where they said, well, that really shouldn't matter. If you want to go to a school district that's further away from you, you should have the right to be able to get yourself to that school district and attend that. That's what we call school choice. Course choice was like the, the next iteration of it is, even if you attend one physical building, you shouldn't be locked into only being able to take the curriculum that that one building offers you. You can take options to get additional content. Um, and so that this whole 21F is in that vein of course access, course choice. The uh, just some definition pieces and the graphics that I'm going to show you as I walk through 21F are really set up in a, an important way, which is if, have, how many of you guys like read legislation and policy on, on a frequent basis? 
it's not, you know, unless yours is really different, ours is not highly consumable to the public. And so part of what I want to model for you is the graphics that we put together is how we try to take policy and communicate it to people so that they can understand it in like an at a glance visual way. So that's part of what we try to do to help our consumers. So obviously there's some key pieces of definition that if, when you look at the legislation you have to understand. You, it sounds like in Ontario, the course content for you guys is more centralized than what we do, but what Michigan's law basically says is that we are gonna have a statewide catalog. We're gonna have a centralized catalog, but any school district is allowed to put their courses in that catalog. The state's not involved with that. There are parameters which you get in which like qualify the course to be in there, but each of the school districts have the ability to offer courses to students across the state. It's not, it's not the, the department or your ministry is, our, our equivalent of your ministry of education is not the one providing that. Um, and so we have that kind of that primary district is where the child lives and the funding. So in Michigan's funding model, the child has a, a basic a traditional school that they would attend. The state pays that school. The school then contracts with whoever in that catalog and pays the fee for the online course. So the state doesn't change at all how it pays. It just treats it as like the school has another vendor that it needs to cover the cost for and it uses the money that's appropriated from the state to pay those vendors. So that's why we have the difference between like a primary district where the kid's located and a providing district which is where they're going to pay to provide that online course. Um, the provider. Teacher of record, instructors, we, we don't need to get into that too much, but here's one of the key pieces. The only type of online learning that was permissible in the course access program is ones that have an actual instructor within them. And I'm assuming most of you, you know, work in this space, you'll know that there's a lot of online um, like skills-based software where you, know, you, you, can, you can interact, there's not a teacher through the, the system. Um, those are not allowed in this in this kind of catalog. There has to be an online instructor of record that is actually interacting with the child through the learning management system in order for it to be considered a course under 21F. Um, we have in legislation the permissible denial uh, reasons. And it specifically says if you are not choosing one of these reasons, you are not allowed to block that request. Does it happen? Yes, it happens. But that, in theory, it ought not to. So some of these are pretty basic. Um, the, the law has been rewritten that says kids in K through 12 are eligible. So anyone in K through 12 can exercise that right. However, the district is given back the permission to block anyone in K5. It's a permission-based thing. It's not a requirement. So if a school district has a fourth grader, and they receive a request from the parent or student to take the course out of that online, they could choose not to block it. They could say, yeah, I think this is what's right for this child and move on. Uh, but they have the right to say no. The uh, credits have already been granted, so the concept like if the kid got a B minus in algebra one and wanted to retake it again, the school could say, no, we're not gonna burn another you know, uh, cost for that credit. If you're successful, we're gonna move on. So that's the reason. Um, if it's not capable of generating academic credit, so there are some enrichments or audit things that are maybe less than a full credit course. So if there are those kinds of things, the state wouldn't pay for it to try to advance them across their graduation program. So again, they could say no to something like that. Um, if it's not consistent with the student's remaining graduation requirements or what their career path is, so if there's a child who like needs to get out and they have three courses that they have to take in order to graduate, and, and they said, no, I want to take this other fourth one. They're like, no, we're gonna get you out. We're not gonna accept that. It's, you need to move through so you finish your curriculum on time. Um, the prerequisite coursework. So, you know, the freshman who comes in and hasn't had chemistry but wants to take AP Chem, they're gonna say, well, let's slow down. Let's make sure you at least possess the prerequisite, or we believe you have a good uh, possibility of, of passing it. So that's a permissible one. The, this is really interesting because this one has changed a little bit and gets interpreted what? <laughs> Failure in an online course does have some impact on potentially denying a subsequent enrollment, but there's two caveats on that. It has to be in the same subject area, 
So if I fail Algebra 1 and I want to take English 9 online, that's not a reason, my lack of success in Algebra 1 is not a reason for me to be in, not enrolled in, in English 1. And it has this uh, time frame, so it's about two years. Ahead. So if it, it was in the most two academic years, if as a freshman I failed that Algebra 1, I want to come back, you know, my junior or senior year and take something online, they can no longer invoke the notion that I was, I was, I had lack of success. And then the cost of the online course. Um, the way our uh, funding is set up in the state, there's a minimum foundation allowance that every school district gets. And our, and that changes from one year to the next, usually upwards, but not always. Um, the amount of money is set in the legislation at 6.67% of that appropriation. So I, I didn't, it's probably about 115, 116, something like that of the uh, appropriation. So if the dollar amount is beyond that, the school district can say, I'm not going to uh, allow the child to enroll. Now, a little bit of a caveat on that. The parent can choose to pick up the difference. And, and then the school would be on the book. So the school is capped, it's kind of liability, it's cost liability is capped, and only then could it pass the overage over onto the parent, it cannot otherwise pass the cost over onto the parent. And then the parent has the right to be able to choose whether they want to do that. I will tell you in practice, there's almost no courses in that online catalog that are up at that 6.67%. In the catalog, most of the courses are around, let's say, three to $400 for a semester length course, and that Includes the cost of the online instructor and then the curriculum and learning management, all of that kind of baked in around 300 for regular courses. AP, you guys have advanced placement courses? Okay, so the AP course is more 395, 400, somewhere in that ballpark typically in the catalog. Whereas the 6.67 would be more closer to $500, of course. So no one is in that cap space uh, for the most part. The, uh, the course is of insufficient quality or rigor is a very interesting denial reason because it's really a bit hard to measure, uh, especially when you, you might not even have access to the online course itself before you have to make a determination. So this is more typically vendor-based. There might be um, programs that have more familiarity, more familiarity with or comfort with a certain provider that might be in that catalog. And if a student comes in and says, well, you know, I want to take out the one with this particular provider, you're going to say, I don't think that their quality is up to what our school, we think our school is. But if you choose to do that, it's not an outright denial. It is not that vendor. You, we will help you figure out what is the right vendor. So, okay, not out for one with company A, but out for one with company B or school district B. And then they work with them to be able to find uh, that work. The course enrollment is not in the time frame. So you guys probably deal with this where a student comes in and they want to change their course schedule, very typical at the very beginning of the year. But if four weeks into the class, the kid's like, nope, I'm done, I want to take that online course, that's outside of their traditional frames. They would not have to honor that request. The, the only difference would be if the student is brand new to the district, where you know the kid comes in, kind of reset the clock for them, and you, you would talk about that at that time. Um, and that kind of applies to the same thing, which is, you know, is it is it made in the semester, trimester, or whatever um, that was preceding the enrollment? So those two are somewhat related. We ran into uh, a situation early on where. Uh, schools were blocking enrollment requests for reasons that they really should not. Um, and the, the mechanism was not as formal as it could have been. So in subsequent revisions, one of the things we said is, if you're going to deny, it actually has to be in writing. You, you need to document it, you need to provide that documentation to the parent. And the parent can then take that documentation and appeal it up the chain. And I, I'm not as familiar with your structure, but in our case, we have like a local district, and, and then the, each district has an, uh, a RISA or an ISD kind of above it that sits in its region. You, um, what's the equivalent? Their school boards would be the equivalent of our RISAs. Yeah. Okay, so if the building level principal said, no, your board, 
we could, it could be appealed up to the board level, and the parent could say, this was blocked at this local level, and it was for a reason that was not permissible. I would like it overruled. And then that, that ISD or your board person would have to weigh in on it. And if they didn't weigh in out with a certain amount of time, it would be automatic granted, and the school would have to be able to find. So it's kind of a checks and balance on the system to make sure that um, it was the law was playing out, the parent and the student right were protected. Okay. The, the law gets really granular as well as those, remember I said a district that put courses into the catalog, it talks to them about what are the courses that they are allowed, how, how do they do that mechanism. And I will get into these relatively quickly, but the course has to be part of a published catalog or it has to be in that statewide catalog. Um, you guys have, uh, I believe, uh, some kind of a central enrollment process. Or some, we have something similar. It's called My Courses, MI Courses, and you'll see some screens in a little while about that. But there's a central uh, group. If it is being offered across district lines, if it's being offered to kids outside your school, it had to be in My Courses. You had to assign a teacher of record, and that's the person who's actually going to be responsible for um, teacher effectiveness mode or the evaluation on those children. And they almost always sat outside of the district where the child was. If the child's in District A, it's a teacher in District B who's teaching that course, who's being responsible for the effectiveness of that child. We did have some community college language in here, for those of you in higher ed. Um, community colleges are kind of like our associate's two-year degrees. None of them have been put in the catalog, so it's permissible, but they're not going down that route right now. We have dual enrollment. And Talk about that later if you like, but to date there's not any community colleges taking advantage of this uh, language. It has to be offered in a semester or tri uh, trimester open entry, so it's just kind of a format thing. It gets back a little bit more to that credit bearing component. There has to be a course syllabus, and I'm going to get in a little bit into what a course syllabus is, but it's pretty robust in terms of what that counts for. And uh, really unique, if you're going to offer courses, you have to include student performance data. And I'll share more about that, but the, the catalog says by October 1, if you're going to offer courses in the upcoming school year, and any of those courses are ones that you offered in the previous school year, you're going to tell the public how many enrollments did you have, and how many of those enrollments are in 60% or more of the total course points. So they're going to compute what we call basically a pass rate in that catalog, and that's going to become public knowledge that consumers can use. Uh, so let's talk about the syllabi. This, these elements are in the legislation. Each one of them is spelled out and, and said this has to be part of the component of a course syllabi. And we'll kind of run through them relatively quickly. An alignment document. So an alignment document for us is most of the courses, many of the courses, maybe not every elective, but for sure the ones that are required for graduation. The state has a set of standards, a curriculum standards, and you have to create a map back to your, what you're doing in that course back to those standards so that anyone could look that up and understand how that course works and how that course meets those standards. With the course content outline, so you have a little bit like, hey, there might be these four or five units. These are the topics that are covered within it. That's visible to them. Uh, required assignments within the course, we'll talk a bit about that, as well as any of the prerequisites. So if you need, if they recommended you needed to take something beforehand, that's listed. The expectations of interactions for the students with their instructors, that's a written field and the school puts down what those things are. For instance, some, many of our courses are all asynchronous. Uh, is that a term familiar? Asynchronous meaning the, the teacher and the, the students are not online at the same time. Many of them are, but some of them have a, a asynchronous components. Could be labs, and especially in world languages where they, they might have office hours or other things where they need to get in at the same time. So those kinds of expectations are laid out in a field like that. The academic support to the student. So again, how are they providing, whether that's office hours or other kinds of support that they have. The learning outcomes and objectives, you guys are probably very familiar with. Outcomes and objectives, those are, those are included in the syllabi. Um, the name or institution that's providing that course. So we think, think about it in two ways. We kind of uncouple that course and we say somebody built the course in terms of someone created the IP, the intellectual design of that course. And that's what we would put in as the organization um, providing content. And somebody's providing the teacher. These two are often the same, but they do not need to be, right? Because a local district, 
could be getting their content from some third party provider, but then using the district teacher to teach it, or they could be using the third party provider's teacher to teach it. So those uh, distinctions are also made in the syllabi. Um, the title of the course, the, uh, do you have, do you guys have a, something similar to SCED? So the concept, the concept here is, and you guys probably have, have run into this, is people don't call the courses the same thing in any district. Maybe Algebra 1 is a little bit more similar, but the course, the local titles that they are, it, you may not look at one and understand what it is the equivalent of in your own district. So in the U.S., we have like an entire taxonomy. And so each of the courses get mapped onto that taxonomy, and then they know how their courses move and then just because I say mathematics and baseball, you might consider it some other, you know, consumer math. You know, that might be your terminology. You can kind of do the crosswalk through that national mapping program to be able to figure that out. The number of eligible students, and this might be an interesting question. I don't know how you having conversations up here. You probably don't know how either. But if the idea is that students in, in your province have access to these online courses, what do you do when there's no longer capacity for those courses? And, and you know, uh, first blush people say, well, there's always capacity. It's online. You just make the next section. Well, usually the capacity issue is teacher certification. So take something like American Sign Language or a sign language course or something else, computer science maybe, where you, you've got real shortages in terms of the number of people who can teach that. Um, when the demand for students supersedes your capacity, how do you deal with that? And in our language, we the language was built off of the same thing as that school of choice language, which basically says it's a lottery. If, um, if there's a cap, everyone's name goes into a hat up to a certain date, and if there's capacity, you get drawn out, and you find out whether or not you've made it into that course. And if you didn't, you kind of get put on a waiting list. But not every course has unlimited capacity, and how do you deal with it? That kind of idea is built into the legislation to think about handling that scenario. We are unique in that the syllabi requires a course review according to the IMA call standards. Um, and I may call this was, was, was more default as we move in. People familiar with NSQOL, National Standards for Quality Online Learning. There's a new body um, that's both the BLA and Quality Matters that have been working to create a new set of standards. Those course standards will come out in uh, the fall here. But they're an update and a revision to the national standards. Uh, and those, those NSQOL standards will replace the INACOL ones in subsequent years, but the bottom line is INACOL has 52 standards that a course is evaluated on, and in order for a course to be put in, this, in the statewide catalog, it has to have a rating against all 52 of those standards, and, and each of those ratings is going to be displayed, and I'll, I'll show that to you later, in the catalog for people to be able to look at and use as information to make a decision. So those are all syllabi pieces. They are not optional. They are spelled out in the legislation. And if you do not do them, your course is not available. Um, part, uh, another part of that is the teacher of record. Again, we had some definitions that you'd be able to go back and look at. This is that, that human being who is interacting with the child through the learning management system. They have to be Michigan certified. They have to be highly qualified. They have to be, you know, hold endorsement at their grade level or subject area. They have to be considered the, the expert for that. The school district has to be able to provide the other one with their unique identification code. So at least in Michigan, the state knows who every teacher is, and they use that information as part of their renewing certification and, and their teacher effectiveness modeling. That information is shared with them so that tracking can occur. And then um, the, the piece on the right just really gets into what do we mean when we're talking about providing instruction. So you'll see assessing, you'll see diagnosing learning uh, needs, you're going to see prescribing strategies and modifying lessons and so on. It kind of defines what's that role as a teacher because in a little bit I'm going to fracture uh, the human supports into a couple of different ways to think about, but that's what it means for a, a instructor of record. The final piece here is a requirement for a mentor, and I don't believe you have this. 
Um, Michigan is a little bit unique, at least more unique in the sense of the mandating of it, and um, uh, other states have similar rules, but they may not legislate them. If you're familiar with a facilitator, a guide, I think you were talking last night, was it a, a DELC? Is that, is that what the... No, they're the district it? person. Well, what's the district person's term? That That's the say? DELC or TELC. That's okay. the term. It's, TELC, is it? No? It's, it's, it's a more that they're in shape. It's either okay. DELC or TELC. Okay, okay. It may be something similar to your DELC or TELC, I'm not exactly sure, but the, the role behind the, the mentor is a couple of things. If the state is paying for that course, then the child must be assigned a mentor. The mentor must be a professional employee of the school district. The person does not have to be certified, so they could be a paraprofessional or somebody like that. But their focal point is to serve as kind of boots on the ground or an on-site support for that child. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, in but their focus is to do things like uh, the, the, the online teacher is not probably going to be able to really help the child navigate the technology needs in the local building, and that child may not have that capacity. So that person who's actually physically in that building with them, they help them figure those things out. If the child, and this probably never happens for you, but if the child doesn't log in and doesn't get the messages and all the communication that that online instructor is, the, the breakdown is not great, right? So that's when our online instructors get in touch with the mentor and say, help me track this person down, let's find them, let's get them back. So it's that ability to have somebody locally that can help support that child. Uh, and that's the mentor. And that's, again, spelled out in legislation. So all of those different pieces represent the requirements of 21 app and course access. So two policies. Our mandatory e-learning, our more new 21F, that's the environment we've been living in for the last more than a decade. Um, and now I want to kind of shift to the part of the, the talk where I say, uh, so what, what, what do we have to offer in Michigan that I think have parallels to issues you guys might want to be dealing with when you go back to the districts, or topics we want to talk about today when we, when we move into it. So I, I'm gonna, I got 10, I'm gonna start with my first one. My first one here is focus on opportunity. And if you read my blog post that uh, Kenny Lim put up, I called this focus on spirit. And I decided to change that terminology because while I was pretty clear in understanding of what the spirit of Michigan's legislation, I don't necessarily have the same idea of what the spirit of your proposed legislation is behind that. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna change my terminology a little bit and say I think it's really uh, about focusing on the opportunity. Here's what I mean by it. I grabbed this picture, I don't know if this is exactly where everyone goes, but wherever it is, people are gonna spend a lot of time mulling over whatever is in that boilerplate, whatever is in that proposed legislation. You're gonna read it word for word, and you're gonna, you're gonna look at that, and you're gonna know what the letter of that is, right? And you're gonna be asking yourself, how do I make sure that I am checking all of those boxes? You have to do that. But it's not the most important thing. You need to focus here. You, you need to look at your own kids and focus on them and think about the opportunities you need to be providing for them in order to get them to that end state, right? And the end state at some point is four credits, but I, I, would, I would argue it's not about four credits. Four credits is a minimum, what you want is to have the kids leave your programs with the ability and the competency to be able to exercise online learning or e-learning when it is right for them when they leave your school. I, I offer you what we call our online learning readiness rubric, the link to it there, but one of the conversations we have all the time with schools is they'll say, well, we got an online learning requirement. I need to give this kid an online course. And we ask the question, is the kid ready for an online course? Where is the child at in their spectrum of preparedness to be able to do this? Is that the right thing? Um, and, and 
more advanced schools and more successful programs understand that it's a learning trajectory, like a learning pathway and a progress for that kid. Black schools that don't understand this to me ask questions like, um, is, is online learning right for Johnny? And we, we really work hard with them and try to say, let's ask a different question. Let's ask, what's the next learning experience Johnny needs to continue to move closer to where we want him to be. And unfortunately, um, sometimes the conclusion in many places, it's a, it's a full e-learning course, and, and the kid's just not ready for that. Um, and sometimes they can handle multiple. But what we have in this online learning readiness rubric is a series of dimensions. So you can see on the left there, kind of um, balloon it out different dimensions that we look at and, and less to more ready on those scales. And what we ask and try to get schools to do is have a child take a look at this. You know, how would they evaluate or rate their readiness on these different dimensions? So how about your parent? Could the parent independently go through this and do it? Could the mentor or whoever your counselor is or the, the next person you know, put those things down on a piece of paper and then triangulate them and come together and say, what do we think about Johnny or Sally, right? Where are they at? What do we need to do for them to be able to get them to where we need by the time they exit our system? And it's such a more nuanced conversation. We don't use this necessarily as a yes, no, right? If you don't score a certain level, you cannot have an online course. But we use it to be able to start the conversation about is it right and is it right right now? Right? If it's not, what are we going to do to help move them a little bit further? And if it is, what are the things that I already know I should be watching out for, either as the parent or as the mentor or as the student? Uh oh, time management may be an issue for me. I'm going to be running into an environment where if someone's not really holding my hand from a time management perspective. I'm going to need to step up in those ways. It, it allows you to have some conversation up front before you make, make the decision it's too late and be proactive about it. So focus on that opportunity, and that's really about the kid. Know your stuff about your policy, but it's not going to help those kids be successful, right? It will help you make sure you can check the boxes and get them through to get the diploma. But those separate those two things out. They're different. Uh, nothing is perfect. Is my second option. When we got into this, uh, the legislation. To say there's lots of tug of war or resistance, I think, would be an understatement. And, and I'm sure you have seen this, you've had conversations about it in your districts, you've probably read it in the news. But let me just, I'll share a couple of different examples about what we heard and saw when some of these policies were brought out. Um, multiple administrators, multiple administrators I had conversations with, and it went something like this. 21F allows a parent or a student to come in and say, I want to take an online course, even if the course is available face-to-face -face in that building with a teacher. And the administrators would say, what am I supposed to do when I have 30 parents who, and their children who come to me and say, I don't want them having this experience. We are not going to have our kids do this, and there's a basically a mutiny on their hands. Just nobody wants to take this step. <laughs> I don't know if I always handle these things appropriately, but the conversation I have with them is: so it sounds like there is a teacher in your district that you're so concerned about that the parents and the students would avoid at any cost that it's realistic that this is going to happen, right? And, and you think online learning or this 21F policy is a problem. <laughs> and so we kind of talk about that. You know, is it realistic? And some of it, well, no, it's not not super realistic, but it's a possible, well, is it a, is it a likely possibility? You know, and you kind of talk them down off much. But I've, ta I've talked to a lot of administrators, and when it first came out, it was, you know, skies fall, what if this happens? And as they go through, I think they recognize it's unlikely to happen, and if it did, boy, what an what if, uh, important piece of information for me to know about maybe I've got some work to do on professional development, building an individual's 
uh, plan and how do we move through that. So I would say, you know, we, we saw that kind of resistance. Uh, we heard a lot of this. Well, the thing you got to know, Joe, is at XYZ High School, we have really high standards for our students. Uh, but our peers, they don't, they don't have the same kind of standards. They, they water down the hood. And it would be constant. Everyone, same thing. <laughs> a lot of distrust about what their peers would put into the, into the catalog and, and uh, that somehow their own students were getting a much better education with their own program than they would if somebody else were allowed to educate. And in, in a very in, uh, environment where graduation rates or other things are important, it was a, a big concern that no one will do it as well as I do. That, that's gone away. Heard it up front, didn't, didn't hear it later. Right? But, but a concern that they have. Uh, we heard we heard the idea that uh, what I'll call it basically is a punitive response. Yep, you will honor that 21F request. It's your right to make it, but you gotta know what? You're on your own. Don't want you coming to school. You take that hour, you go wherever you want to do. Uh, your mentor, I gotta assign your mentor. Your mentor is the janitor. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Or it's uh, a building principal, which good luck trying to get access to that building principal, right? And, uh, and shockingly, the results weren't very good, right? It's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. See, look, I told you this would work. Right? Um, all kinds of different resistance to that. And, uh, and, and something that we kind of work through and think about. The, the last point I want to put about this is I don't think it's going to matter whatever your legislation comes out with. It will have things that it does not answer. And you're going to read that, and you're going to read it, and you're going to read it, and you're going to go, it says absolutely nothing about this thing I need an answer to. And if your cycles are like ours, you're like, well, maybe I'll get an answer next year when they can revise the policy. Maybe. But that doesn't help me now. So how do you figure out then who's going to make that answer? Um, in our state, what happens is that our Department of Education, the equivalent of your ministry, and Michigan Virtual write frequently asked questions because we would just get inundated from people. I don't know how to do this. The law is silent on that. And we would work with the department, both the document, here's the question your peers are asking. And here's the interpretation that the, the department has about is it permissible, is it not, or how to handle this situation. And we had 50, 60, maybe 70 different questions. And they would change from one year to the next as the policy would change. Right? But you need a mechanism in place, I think, and, and be proactive about it, about who gets to make that call, and how are they going to make that call, and how do, they, how do questions and things get put forward, how, like, who are they supposed to go to, how they get aggregated, how they get turned around in a time frame where people can make decision is I unless you guys are way better than we are the policy will not be enough it will not have the details we want and someone's going to have to decide it um, hi we talk about online learning and e-learning and a ton of the conversation, and probably today, and rightly so. I don't say that this is not a conversation we have. But it looks like this. It looks like we need to talk about technology. Right? We, we're going to talk about a lot of technological access, computers, you know, content, all these things, right? And, and I say you have to have those conversations, but that's not, that's not what separates good and high-performing programs from those who are low performing programs. What separates them is the high touch components. And so what I'm, what I'm offering you to say is, for as long as you're having conversations about technology and have them, you need to be having conversations in your district about the high touch elements, about creating relationships with students to make them feel cared about, and how you're gonna support them with the non-technological components, the human capacity, the human components of them, if you don't do that, you will not get the results, and those kids are not going to get the education that they need. And that fits pretty well with this next point, which is you, 
you need to invest in supports. And I'll talk to you about how we think about those supports in Michigan Virtual. At Michigan Virtual, we, the kind of the mental model that we run is we put the child and our students inside of a triangle of support. So you, a good program is going to use an entire triad of support around this child. The online teacher or the online instructor kind of is at the tip of that. They're going to be the ones who are our content matter experts. They're going to be the ones who are teaching those kids the subject area content. Right? That's just one part of what you can do. The mentor that I have in that bottom lap, we kind of talked about a little bit. But this person is really critical because um, some students will never ever meet their, their, their mentor or their online instructor. They may not necessarily develop the greatest relationship with that person. They may, the person they may spend their most time with is that mentor because oftentimes the mentors are in a lab situation. You guys have a lot of, many of your schools have like a computer lab or a media center or some other place where those children can go on kind of a daily basis to take their courses. Oftentimes that's where that mentor interacts with them. So it's that person daily who's checking in with them. Not just about like, what did you do? You know, did you turn in that assignment? But like, hey, what's going on in your life? How are things with mom? You know, I know X, Y, Z is, you know, this person is sick. Building a relationship, building somebody who cares about that child and someone who can help communicate with that mentor. Teaching little things like our students, maybe not yours, but our students really don't know how to talk to teachers via email or other kind of communication. They, they, just, they don't know how to do that. And so our mentors coach them like, here's how to ask a better question. Or here's how you can phrase it. You, like all of these little kind of maybe metacognitive elements that they can add to that child to help enrich that. They don't need to be subject matter experts. They just need to know that child and help them. And then the parents on the other role. What's the role that the parents are going to be playing? You know, in some cases, uh, parents are super involved. In other cases, you could, you could, you know, you'll never get a response from us. But this triad of support really needs to work well and in order for these kids to be, you know, successful. Or what we see is that most successful programs have this working well. Now, I'll say, um, you know, I do some research. I'm trying not to be super researchy in this uh, talk. I don't think this is exactly obvious. But uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Jerry Bora, who's out here at Mason, said, you know, we has looked at this data and said, really, that one of the key components is less about who serves each of these roles and just make sure that the roles are clear. So, for instance, if what you really want to have is your online instructor being the key person who's delivering the content and teaching the instruction methodology, that mentor who takes on that role could really undermine it, right? Yeah, don't do it that way. I'm going to teach you this other way, right? And then the, then the student gets stuck and in a weird spot. Like, my instructor's telling me this, but my mentor's telling me this, right? It puts them in an uncomfortable position. And so whatever this triad looks like, I think you need to spend some time in your district to be able to say, what are the roles and responsibilities we want each of these things? What do we want the parent to do that we don't want the mentor to do, or vice versa? And if those things are clear up front, then you're going to be in a much better place to be able to, to provide it. I, I labeled this one Build Confidence Through the Catalog. Um, I may not have looked at the right place for your catalog, but I try to dive in and look at it, and our catalogs don't look alike if the guy was in the right place. And so I want to just give you um, some advice about why I think this is a critical mechanism. This is. This is an example of what uh, we would see. Remember I talked about the course syllabi, um, the different elements that are in there? Uh, I, don't, hey, I don't think there's anyone who does this that likes their catalog, so I'm going to put myself in that boat. But I want to show you some of the elements that I think are important. One is the catalog, for lack of a better way of thinking about this, is an opportunity for you to build public confidence or at least confidence in each other. And I think it's important to think about it that way. So what you're seeing on here um, is some of those different pieces that we already talked about. You know, who's providing? What's the course title? On the left are each of these little different tabs that you can click on. So if you wanted to see a course offering, like the offering will tell you these are all the different times this course is being offered throughout the year. So you, you, is it available in a semester? Is it available in a trimester? What are the dates that it runs? You can find all those things in the course offering. And the prereqs and the descriptions are probably pretty straightforward. How to enroll? Who am I supposed to contact when I need to roll? That information is in there. 
But if you look, for instance, in particular, that alignment document that I told you before, that alignment document is really important. But maybe one of the areas that it's most important in is that it creates, in some ways, a little bit of a gateway for people to participate. Because there's plenty of people who have online courses, and, and very few of them are willing to do the work to put the course syllabi together, to go through all of this documentation, to do the course review, to put it in. And so you, whether or not uh, you have great confidence that every one of the course reviews has a great reliability and validity, and I don't necessarily have it, at the very least, you know that they took time to put something into it that it was important enough to do them, and that leads some kind of credence so people look at it. I mentioned uh, the course performance data. I can't tell you how many times uh, we go back and say, hey, are you going to offer those courses again next year? Like, no, you know, we're going to go with a different provider and we're no longer going to do it. And I think to a large extent, it ha it's this mechanism. That is, if the, if the school's not having great performance, they're not advertising that. They're not going to put that course back in the next year. Right? They don't want to come out and say, yeah, last year we had 200 kids and only 10% of them passed. They're going to go, no thanks, we're not going to offer that class. And so the kind of the, the transparency that this provides, uh, you, you know, it's kind of like that uh, antiseptic that says, over time, people are only going to be putting in the things that the students are more successful with. And we're going to allow you to see all of that as you try to figure out that quality, that rigor, student success that's open to parents and others uh, to be able to look at that. So that, that I think is a really important piece. And then this is just an example of those standards that I had mentioned, where you could look up and you could see things like, when was the last time this course had been reviewed? If it hadn't been reviewed in seven years, I'd have some concerns about it, right? And if you want to look at any particular one of the 52 INAPL standards, you could drill down to that particular standard and understand uh, who it was, you know, what the rating was on that. Uh, so that, again, just gives some kind of a flavor of a little bit more confidence in the catalog. We run into um, uh, issues where it's very hard, right, to know and keep track of 25 different providers. So I, I, what I guess I would say is that for us, most times people people land on a provider that they like and they have confidence in, they build those relationships. But in general, and in particular, because parents and students tend to be the first shopper, the parent and student that find something that comes back and says, hey, this looks really good. I, I want my child to be able to do this. Um, this information, they can't, they can't make an informed decision. And that's a really big difficult, right? Think about that. In, in our policy, parents and students are making the choice. So let's, let's make sure it's the best choice they can make. And you guys are in the same boat, right? You're going to be trying to figure out what's the best choice that these kids be making out of this kind of centralized catalog. What do you need to know to help, help make that best one for those kids? My number six lesson I'm going to say is play to strengths. Um, give you a, I'll give you a scenario that looks something like this. Um, in Michigan, we know, or we've known, uh, because every child uh, in the past handful of years, their entire educational record is written to uh, the state, it's shared with the state, and we can compute these statistics. Like, if a child in a year did not take an e-learning course, what we call a virtual learning course. If they did not take it, everything they took was face-to-face. -to -face. Out of every 10 face-to-face -face courses they took, on average, they passed nine. If uh, a child was flagged as taking at least one thing that was delivered virtually or your e-learning course, out of every 10 courses that that child takes, they pass seven. Something mostly goes wrong for virtual learning in Michigan to occur. It could be benign, all right? So, something that goes wrong. Um, there's a course that's offered first hour that the child wants to take. It's only offered first hour, but they have to take something else first hour in order to fulfill their graduation requirement. So we call this scheduling. Here's my data. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit later that I do a lot of data work, but um, here's the records that we see. That top row 
is how students perform when they take one or two virtual courses in a year. The second, three to four, and the final row, five or four. It's stark, right, in the fact that the kids who take one or two always outperform the kids who are taking three or four, always outperform the students who are taking five or more. The shape, and it has been the shape for almost an entire decade I've been looking at it, is pretty U-shaped. Okay? If we were to continue to track this out a little bit more, it would start to come up a little bit more uh, in terms of student performance. And I believe this is more of the full-time programs where they're, they're cognitive. And we can talk more about why this pattern exists, my hypotheses for why this pattern exists. But if you guys have to give students four online courses, do not give them four courses in their senior year to be graduate. Space them out, help them develop competency in it. When they show that they're proficient in it and can handle it, then think about adding some more. Let's start with us. Eighth lesson, monitor effectiveness. One of my jobs every year is to produce an entire statewide review of the successfulness of our programs and online. We call it Michigan's K-12 Virtual Learning Effectiveness Report, and we've been doing this and tracking this data since the 2010-11 school year. We write a very big report with all kinds of numbers and statistics and things in it, and we also take it and we put it in hopefully what it looks like, a pretty consumable infographic way that the public can understand and look at in a really rich way to help us understand whether our policies are working, but also whether our programs are working. So let's take a good, just, just highlight a couple of things on there. What you see is that we have almost 600,000 enrollments last year, at least within the 17 18 school year, for it online. We were over 112,000 kids who participated in it, and that was like 7% of our entire K-12 population. 7% of our K-12 population took something online. Our results were dismal. The results were a pass rate of 55%. But you can somewhat throw that number out. So let's look at some of the nuance. If you were a general education school, if general education was your emphasis, your pass rate was 63%. If you were an alternative education school, we have all, all programs, your, your benchmark is 44. It's almost a 20% difference between those two. If you're dealing with students in poverty, if you tend to have students who are more in poverty, your benchmark, your pass rate was 49%. If students were not in poverty, your benchmark was 69, 20% higher in terms of student performance. We had almost half of every uh, half of the kids pass every single course that they took. But there was, and this is kind of about bottom left there, there were over 26,000 kids who didn't pass a single online course that they took. Fortunately, uh, most of them took only one to two. That was about 42%. But there were 12,000 kids in Michigan who took five or more virtually delivered courses and passed zero of them, none of them. And there were 3,005 who took uh, 11 or more, I believe it was, 11 or more, and passed zero of those courses. What interesting conversations we can have as a pol you know, when we're talking about policy when we look at these data, but also about our own programs. The, the, the report gets into things like tracking it over time. We've gone from 36,000 virtual learners in 2010 to what I told you was over 112,000 in the 17, 18 school year. We've gone from almost just shy of 90,000 enrollments to just under 600,000 enrollments since the 2010-11 school year. We've gone from the number of schools being 654 to 1,158 schools that have virtual learning programs. Everything is going like this. The pass rate is here. Slightly declining, going down. Somewhat stable in the last two years at 55 percent. You have, to, I think, you have to know these things as a as a province to understand the effect of, of the policies that you're having and how they're playing out in practice. And the the data on there are so those are kind of my my comments about um, at the policy level of state. But think about it when you take it back into your own classroom. Right? 
if you want to know how well your school is doing, you probably want to know how your other schools are doing. Well, let's say uh, there are 147 schools in our, our state that have statewide or school-wide pass rates of 70 to 80 percent. If you're in, if that's what your pass rate looks like, you can kind of benchmark that, right? Not bad, but there are 289 that have 90 to 100 percent. Right? Where, do you, where would you fall on that? Where would that fall compared to your peers? Where do you want to be? What does that look like? Um, and when people ask the question, I mean, weren't late people really, but ask the question, does online learning work? I tell you, it depends on which school you go to. Right? If you're in one of those 289 schools that have a 90 to 100 percent pass rate, probably working pretty well for you. If you're in one of those 77 schools that have a zero to a 10 percent pass rate, I want to look for some other option. It's not universal. When we, we have data in here on a per course basis. So this is just looking at the top 10 enrollments in ELA and the state performance. So if you're like fired up because you got a 67% in English 10, I'd ask you, well, let's take a look over here. Yeah, you want to be because the statewide pass rate is 42%. Right? That's something you can feel good about the top. But we give you data back to be able to kind of benchmark and ask these questions, kind of debrief your program. How well are we doing? Where do we need to improve? Who are our peers? How do we think about that? Someone needs to be a monitoring that effectiveness, and um, I think that will go a long way to moving the program along. Learn from each other. S spread best practices. There's going to be things, even today, this is a, an opportunity for us to spread, spread best practices. How are we going to do that? I'm going to show you how we've done that at Michigan Virtual. I'm going to offer these things and to say, there's probably a ton in these guides that will be of value to you, and some of which you can discard because it's really about Michigan policy. There's components of it. But here's what we think. We think that learning is pretty situated or it's role specific. And so we've been spending our time to build a, a guide to online learning for key stakeholders. We have a guide for students, right? What is this online learning thing? What should I be thinking about if I'm even considering it or getting, getting involved with it? We have a, a guide to online learning. All of our guides are free. The mdlri.org slash guides will get you to any of them. Um, they're there. Please use them. We have a guide for students. We have a guide for parents. They're really important in a, in a um, course access uh, environment. But I might argue, like, if from what I understand about some of the policy, it's questionable about whether parents really are on board about this. How are kids, if we go back to this opportunity thing and focusing on students, if, if the people who are trying to provide support for them don't see this as a really positive thing or see and focus on the opportunity for them, man, it's really going to be hard for those kids. So what's the parent role? How do we help educate them? How do we do that? We got a parent guide to do that. We have a mentor guide to online learning. Um, so sorry, a mentor guide. So if you want to know more about what our mentors do and what their roles are and how they can support it, we got an entire guide for that. We have a guide for teachers, pretty robust guide. Because our, our teachers, and like I said, we deliver 30,000 course enrollments. We work with our teachers. We've been doing this a long time. So we think our teachers and your teachers need to know if they're going to be teaching online. We have one for administrators. Because your role is different, right? What you need to do and how you need to facilitate that. We built that guide with several different educational organizations in our state. We have a principals association. We have a, a set, like what your board association would be. We have, uh, you know, um, the elementary versus middle school. Or we work with all of those groups to come up so that they could all say, yeah, these are the things administrators need to be talking about when it comes to online learning. We have a school board guide. We got a lot of lay people who are making really important decisions at the local level, and they have no idea about online learning. How do you educate? How do you spread those best practices? This is how we do it. Um, there are, there's really nuts and bolts components that we put in our toolkit, what we call toolkit. And so this is where our FAQs, you know, if you want to know something the law is not answering, you want an interpretation of it, look at our FAQs. 
If you want to have a sample contract with a parent, you know, like a learner agreement, these are the things. Do the sample one of those because we heard time again people want that. If you need to update your handbook because you, you need to put some language in your parent or student handbook, you know, to go home, we got language there for it. We have uh, school board policies. We have an interview rubric. So when you sit down and talk to that kid, you know, hey, let's talk about online learning. Maybe you're ready for this. We got these materials ready for you. Go ahead and use them. Adapt them. Choose whatever you need to do. But think about all of these resources we've found are necessary to support kids. And then finally, I'm just going to end with this update policy. I talked before about nothing's perfect. Work on it. Iterate with it. Move it. Make it better over time. But from the first generation, we had all kinds of different changes that have existed. Really practical things you learn, like the initial legislation was five, grades 5 through 12. And then when we started running within a month, everyone realized, you know what? Fifth grade's really hard because most of them are self-contained. When, when math is at 9 o'clock on one day and 3 o'clock the next day and 12 o'clock and there's never like a really release period for them, how do you do that online course? There's not really a time I can take them out. You go, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. And then the next year, the law got changed to 6 through 12, but with permission to be able to do it for uh, We had issues uh, of, around funding mechanisms. We can maybe get into that long. I know I'm going a little bit long, but you told me I can kind of see it. So, um, the funding mechanism fundamentally changed over the time that we did it because it wasn't working or it had perverse incentives that were not um, motivating people to do the right thing. And so time and time and time again, that law got updated and changed because people around in the community said there's a better way to do it. And you have to be able to work with the, the, um, the department of your ministry of education. You have to be able to work with your legislators to be able to figure those out, to be able to explain this in ways that they understand why it makes a difference and treat it as a work in progress. Right? That first draft, whatever it is that you get, Probably ought not to be like a draft five years from now. Um, locally, there's a lot of work that's probably going to be done that you're going to need done. Look at your websites. There's probably things on your website style that need to be updated or are out of date. Your handbooks, right? your communication letters to parents and so on. Maybe even pieces that your school board needs to adopt. You need to take a look at those things, put them into communication. I give you an example. I, I uh, I've just spent the last uh, few months trying to get my own child a 21F course, and um, it's an interesting place to be when you know more than just about anyone in the entire state about this legislation. But then you're dealing with school districts as a parent, right? And I can tell you, I constantly got misinformation. Oh, that's wrong. That, that's illegal. Yep, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. And we worked through it. We worked through it, but I, I am not a parent. But this is many years, right? In in a very good district. And they don't they're not up to date. They don't really know. They put themselves at risk by what they have out there or think that they can do. Um, so don't fall into that though. Try to think about updating your policies. So really that's what I wanted I, I try to do those things on. I wanted to try to share with you guys just a whole host of resources because we've been where you're at. We think we've learned a lot, and you don't have to start from scratch. I really encourage you to look at those resources, and I hope I picked on various different topics today, a really wide range, so that for the rest of the conversation today, we can we can really have some fun and dig into what's important to you. So thank you very much for letting me come and present some of our lessons. So on behalf of everyone here, um, it's been incredibly eye-opening, and um, you know, just the the ten takeaways that you gave us there those really are pearls of wisdom. That hopefully that all stakeholders in education in Ontario will, will leverage. Um, I mean, if you came here just for the best practice guides alone, I think it was more than worth it. I know for the past couple of days, I've been glancing through the materials and through all of those different.
provides incredible wealth of information um, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We've already got some great things here in Ontario that we can learn from other districts um, like Michigan here at 12 Online. Thank you so much again. Thanks. So just in terms of curation, just to update you, uh, Michael Barber has been putting uh, the blog posts along. So there's uh, a list of all the sort of the top ones. If you go to the Google site, which has got links, on the Google site under program details, I put a link to uh, Joe's presentation as well as his blog post, which also summarized that, as well as some additional information that will be there. Uh, I want to say thank you to our online audience. We have uh, probably half a dozen or more virtually daily long, uh, six or seven, okay, so if you're counting, you eliminate my computers and it takes everybody out of the room. So, the, uh, so, so welcome and thank you for, for being there for those West Coasters, it's uh, kind of an early start uh, for that. I want to get into some questions as well for Joe specifically about some of that which he shared, and then Michael and I will share some of the more Ontario specific things that we've curated through Candy Learn. Uh, and essentially then this is to lead us into a discussion after the break. So we're kind of flexible in our time, if that's okay with everyone here. We just want to just, you know, get the most out of the sharing. So I think we want to pick Joe's brain a little bit. He will be here as well. Max is going to open this afternoon with some uh, information and notes about experiences through Contact North, Contact North as well. And then we're going to launch into a sort of a future-focused discussion this afternoon about how can we apply some of these things. But this morning is really to tease out ideas and notions and then to th think about how they might be applied in our own practices in Ontario or out west or uh, back east, depending on where you are at. So again, you probably organize yourselves around some of the commonalities in terms of jurisdiction when we do uh, get into discussion. But let's pick Joe's brain a little bit now. I know that Daylene had a question about the refusal, the ability to refuse access to e-learning. It was very early in your presentation. I think it was specifically at the K-5 level what she was interested in, although Daylene can type the clarification as you're going. Yeah, yeah the K-5 level is what she's specifically interested in. Yeah. Okay, so um, just kind of recap. When the legislation first came out, it prohibited anything that was uh, K-4. The schools did not even have the option to, to uh, exercise 21F. Then the following year, as I mentioned, that fifth grade element came up in the self-contained issue. And so we moved that to say, no, it's 612. But then we added language to say, it's also permissible below, but you have the right to deny. So if you're a building level principal and a third grader asks you, hey, I know I'm eligible for 21F, can I take it? Can I take it? That would be up to you. You don't have to say no, but the, the legislation gives you the ability to say no, which is a little bit rare because it, otherwise it's not one of those reasons. You can't you can't legally say no to it. Um, you set yourself up for a risk if you were to try to block on something like that. Um, I don't know how many requests came into that. My my assumption is going to be that. My assumption is it probably doesn't matter because I'm not aware of there being K through four courses or K through five courses in that statewide catalog. It would be more likely if there was a student who had advanced skills, you know, like was a fourth grader but was ready to take a middle school or some kind of course like that, then maybe the catalog would have had something that would have been applicable for them. But if they were on grade, if they were looking for content on grade, the statewide catalog is really even have it so by de facto there wasn't have been something that they so I think it's a little bit more semantics but that's the background um, that you could find. Super. Questions from the audience? Steve. Uh, great presentation Joe. Is the online credit differentiated on the threads? No. Well, can you repeat that? Yeah so the question is is the online um, does it, uh, the online credit uh, designated on the transcript. Because most of the courses, I believe, are occurring through that MMC integration, there's nothing on the MMC course, like an Alpha G is going to say, this, was, this also had an online component to it. 
some school districts, and the school districts have the ability to transcript as they'd like. Some will put, you know, dash online course. Some don't. Some feel like that is potentially a detriment. Some have the philosophy that putting the online, like a designation of online course on it might be negatively by a registrar at a university. So there's some who prohibit it. The language in 21F says that if you take an online course through 21F, you must transcribe that onto the, the, the transcript using the course title that is in that statewide catalog. So you couldn't take, and, and none of the none of them that I'm aware of is like, you know, blah, 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 dash online course. They don't say that. Um, so most of the time I would say there's not like a designation that if you see it in that way that it is clearly coming up as online. I think I heard you say, I like, might be wrong, that the e-learning courses are taken as a regularly scheduled period during school. Or is the expectation that the kids do it during their spares or after hours? As it pertains to, okay, so the question was, when in the school day does the child take an e-learning course? The, uh, it can vary, but essentially this is what happens. The child, the state is giving the child, or giving the school the foundation allowance to educate that child. That education is going to cover whatever gets put on the child's transcript. So if, if uh, we had six hours in a day, there's going to be six courses that they take uh, in the fall and six courses that they take in the spring. If it is for one of those six courses, they have to pay for that. If they want to take it outside of that, let's say the child says, I want to take reading terminology and art, it might be a zero hour or a seventh hour, I don't know if you use that, but basically before school or after school, a school district could say, I've already satisfied your group of courses, right? I've already used the state appropriation to fill an entire schedule for you. You're asking for it above and beyond, and I do not need to support that. Now, the parent could say, okay, drop one of those courses during the school day and put it on in that, in, in that area. So for instance, my child is going to be taking a computer programming course online. He's going to sixth grade. They're going to put that computer programming course on his schedule. He will go to a lab, and let's say it's third hour, he will show up to that lab just like he would go to any other class, but in that class he'll do his online course. And the parents, in our case, will not pay anything because the state's paying for that course. But if it was outside of that, a summer course or something like that, you would, uh, the parent would be responsible for paying. Okay. Paul and someone over here and then... Yeah. I probably have a two-part question when you were yes. talking about the investment in sports and previous <coughs> quickly uh, mentioned given a very quick definition of uh, um, definition of uh, mentor, instructor, and uh, teacher of record. I understand the mentor part, but can you elaborate a little bit more on the difference between the teacher of record and the instructor uh, in our concept of the word? We have used now the last ten years. The teacher of record and the instructor are basically a certified, a qualified teacher uh, under the uh, as an under uh, uh, college of teacher, certified by the college of teacher in Ontario. So I'm just trying to understand. The so what's what's the difference between an instructor of record and a teacher, like an instructor or teacher of record? Yes. In theory, there should be nothing. There should be no difference. In practice, some things play out. So the online instructor is supposed to be the person who's actually coming in through the learning management system and providing support to that child. In theory, the way the system is supposed to work is that person is the one who's supposed to act as the teacher of record and be reported to the state as the one who taught them. Some school districts um, may have uh, like a lab coordinator or that mentor person who they assign may actually be a certified instructor, may be a certified teacher, and oversees the lab. And in some cases, the school prefers to put that person down as the teacher of record, even though they're not through the online system. So that's kind of a nuance. But in theory, it's supposed to be the person who's coming in through the learning management system, not the person who might be face to face. But the teacher of record is a statewide um, reporting requirement. 
So what we may call it an online instructor, the state doesn't collect an online instructor. They just put that teacher's pick, that personnel identification code, in that teacher of record form to tie those two together in terms of accountability. So more administrative, less practice. I was interested in the uh, online career training this rubric. Yep. Can you tell me a bit more about how that was developed, whether that the crossover between districts meet with the impact of these across districts, whether or not there's a kind of an online platform that districts can use to keep that information back to all the around. Yeah. Okay. So uh, tell about the online learning readiness rubric, kind of how it got started. Have, has there been examples of being used multi-district, and then is there any kind of an online version? Um, the, uh, the online readiness rubric was created out of our research institute. Um, it, it occurred in particular when you have through conversations with our student learning teams and the, the areas that we saw uh, students struggling in, and any kind of basic, some components of su success traits that you see in literature. And then kind of broken those out into different uh, levels or gradations that we thought could, could kind of an individual person could somewhat reasonably select the differences between them and try to do it in somewhat of a parsimonious way. There's probably a lot of other dimensions, but we're just trying to start a conversation around areas that we see uh, students struggle with. So we kind of have just more, let's say, more face validity in terms of what you know you look at and say these seems like reasonable things to address. Um, in terms of how it can work with a particular district, um, you know, if, let's say you have your own student who evaluates it, you have your own parent or whatever, that information can easily, because it is a PDF or it has a PDF output, can easily be shared with that uh, teacher or that, that your mentor should be in your own district so they should know it, but can be shared with their online instructor. It's not the same thing, but an IEP or a Bible or you could like special education requirements or other documentation that's frequently provided to that online provider. This could be another component of that be able to say, hey, these are what we think you need to know about our child. These are the things are where we think their strengths or weaknesses or areas for growth. And so as you're trying to coach and work with this child through the program, to the extent that you can help work on some of these other skills, that might help prepare them better. Um, there is an interactive rubric, so there is a way, it's not exactly in the way that you think of it because it's more like you just press a button and some stars will appear uh, to be shared, but it could be moved and migrated into something, let's say, like a Google form that could be aggregated or shared. Just on that note, just a question generally, do you want to address this particular question about student readiness? No. no. So is there an appetite in Ontario for something like that to be shared amongst districts? Head nods, head nods, hands up, whatever. That's more feedback to your consortium leads, I would suggest. Sorry to dump that on you, Michael. It's Paul and Todd, but that's the way we roll here. Yeah. Okay, question in the back. Yep. Go ahead. My question was about your son who's going to take the course in the third hour. When he goes to the library to do so, which supervisor is given all the other students who are doing that in all the different schools during the first through six hours? Yeah, so in his particular case, his counselor will be listed as his mentor of record. And usually there will be like a paraco or somebody else who would be part of that lab setting. In the district that they're in, just as I know some others are using technology, the district that they're in is a be able to bring your own device. So he will be provide well, they, they the school issues their own devices, so each of the kids have their own devices, so they can show up technically anywhere, but they also have lab and other other settings. So whatever the hour of the day is scheduled, he will show up in there. We'll know who his mentor is, but his mentor may not necessarily be present on every day because that person serves the role of the counselor. And they, it's not unusual for a school district to have multiple mentors. So you may have three or four, and somebody staffs a lab, and someone, depending on their subject area expertise or other role, may have um, be kind of ultimately responsible for the child. Or in some cases, um, like our counselors might be determined by student last name, you know, A through F gets this, these children that way. So they, they can be broken in a, in a variety of ways, but usually there is an adult who supervises that lab setting for that hour, and that would be the person who would be providing some of the you know, direct help or questions that, that the child might have, because the teacher is asynchronous, right? If they ask a question to the teacher, they maybe 24 hours before they get it back, if they need something kind of on the spot, that person can find them. And that's a legislative policy requirement. Yes. And it's also in the Ontario Handbook, but I know it doesn't exist in other provinces in Canada as a requirement. So it can be hit and miss, 
I think you're nodding, Frank. In Alberta, there's no requirement for an on-site mentor, is there? Yeah. And even with the, and even with the policy, it's hit or miss. As I mentioned, we get janitors and we get you know, principals who are listed. In other cases, school districts will invest and they'll have five, you know, five really top-notch mentors who serve it. So it depends on how they invest in the program. Well, uh, so this is the providers are at the level, which is equipment for our boards. What do you see the advantages of uh, leaving delivery at the local level as opposed to at the state level? So the question was really, um, as it pertains to kind of putting courses into a catalog, what's the advantage of having more decentralized, allowing districts to be able to put the content in versus uh, a centralized approach? Well, um, for one, our, our, our Department of Ed would have no capacity to do this. Um, they, they, they just, that's not what they do, and I don't think they can do it well. Um, the, the decentralized component, at least, is we have some really good programs out there, but it tends to be less um, less standard. So the, the ones that the programs are going to put in might be something that they think is unique and novel. They're not necessarily putting in the next, the fifth algebra two course, right? But it might be like, hey, we got a babysitting course. We you know there are tons of people who need to get certified in babysitting. And we think we've got teachers, whatever you do, it's unique. Our kids love it. Maybe someone in another district will have it. And the, the other benefit of that is it, it actually becomes a potential revenue maker for them. And then the districts themselves, because they're providing their own instructors to teach it, I didn't really get into this, but you guys may have this experience. We hear time and again that when uh, a teacher gets an opportunity to teach online, even if it's a section or two, it, it positively impacts what they do back in their face to face classroom. So the fact that those teachers who are working with our kids could actually take these and spend some time online and it improved the 90% of their job that they're doing, what a great benefit, right, in creating those opportunities. So those are some of the things. Super. I think it was Michael and then I have to cross the way, sorry. And we're just working up against catering, bringing us back fresh coffee. So we'll keep this going. Hopefully they'll arrive shortly. And then one in the back and then over here. Okay. Joe. Do you, or how do you accommodate the full range of the student profiling, those who might have physical impairments, those who have behavioral issues, uh, learning challenges, do you, are they accommodated, and how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, so that, it's, a, it's an interesting question about who, first of all, responsibilities in special education. All of that information is documented in, in what we call an individualized education plan or a 50, section 504 document. You must have, I'm assuming you have something similar where you have a committee that says these are the uh, accommodations that the child make. First and foremost, that gets shared with the, with the online provider, whichever one that is. And then part of it has to be broken down to figure out, um, you know, because some of the accommodations are local. So the online provider doesn't really have the ability to provide that. It needs to be done at the local. And so there's a just kind of a differentiation between who's going to take on those different responsibilities. It could be things where uh, added time are necessary or somebody needs to read something to another person. And part of it is um, going to be, let's quite frankly, instructional design. So let's just take as an example, uh, I'm sure we'll get into issues of accessibility, but if you have a lot of videos in your classes and they don't have closed captioning, Right? Then you're going to have this, you know, if you, if you don't have uh, language translation. And in some cases, some of the programs, they have the ability to change the grade level of the reading, like the difficulty of the reading level. So there, it could be accommodated in some ways because of the instructional design. But at the very least, the key parts are it needs to be communicated to whoever's doing it at the provider. That local district typically still uh, is responsible for the special education, even though they're farming some components of it out. And then you just need to make sure you understand who can provide which one so that that IEP or that 504 is, is being included. And then part of it might be some conversations ahead of time when you're looking at course selection. And this is where that vendor thing could be really important. Yes, the kid's going to take this particular course. There are six different vendors who may be able to offer that course. Which one is, is going to align with the accommodations of this child? Who are naturally going to align with the accommodations of that child? We try to suss that out and then put them in the best case. Okay, thank you. Over on the side, then to the back. Um, I have a question about um, attendance. So the attendance mechanism for e-learning in Michigan, is it? Um, like they interact with content or something like the course like once a week or do they have to 
um, participate on a daily basis? Like, what does what does that model look like? What I could talk for quite a while because that's one of those areas we're still working on. Let me just say that most of the courses are self-paced. Okay, that means the child starts at a certain date and has to end by a certain date, but they're not penalized for not, you know, turning in things. This works, and we see just such interesting patterns. Um, there will be kids, as an example, who get assigned three or four online courses in a semester. And the way that they are coached to approach those is to do them in sequence, not together, not in parallel. And this tends to be a pattern we see with um, students who are uh, credit recovery or, or challenged to be able to do work. And the concept behind it that they think is, if I spread all of their work out across four, four courses, they might get to 50% in each one of them, and then that's no good, they didn't pass any of them. So what they would prefer to do is say, for this month, you're going to do this one course, and only this one course, and then next month, and then you're going to complete that course, and now I've just got your credit for it. And the next month, you're going to take this other one, and move through. And so it could look like, from an attendance perspective, I haven't seen these kids in my course. I haven't seen them for two months, right? And then all of a sudden, boom! Now they're in it. And that's a kind of a communication question. But our, our teachers kind of have seen these patterns before, and depending on schools and types that they come from, that can happen. But in general, uh, let's talk about it as it pertains to just um, evaluation and, and like pay. Hey. So we have a count day in which, if a child is in attendance on count day, the school receives funding for it. In an online course, you have to like submit an assignment on that count day to be able to be considered in attendance, whereas a typical brick and mortar person, as long as you're in the seat, you're good. And there's a couple of other caveats. If that is not satisfied in that way, they have what's called a four-week uh, count period in which the, that mentor and that student, or the teacher of record student, have to have what they call a two-way interaction log. Means that the student and the, and the um, support person have to have documentation about conversation that is considered to be related to the content of the course, not just like how was the game on Friday. And they have to document all of that for a four week period with at least one contact within each of those four week periods. And they have to submit that documentation to the people accounting auditor in order to try to satisfy getting credit for the course. But what we see in the different trajectories, perspective, Students tend to do better if they can kind of chunk through it consistently. And different providers may do this differently, but we have a pacing guide in our courses where we say, this is these are the sequence of events, and if you kind of the quarter of the way through, you should be about here. So even though it's self-paced, we give kind of recommendations, and we have some intelligent agents inside the learning management that might say, you're behind schedule, you're ahead of schedule. Um, but students who kind of plug their way through usually do the best. There are some who can really accelerate, you know, and um, do a lot of the course in a short amount of time. But students who fall behind almost never really get caught up, unless it's one of those scenarios where I said where it's it's determined ahead of time. There's something else that's going on. You know, I'm at the Olympics, you know, or I'm doing whatever that, that happens, right? That's sometimes why kids are taking an online course and their schedule won't allow for it, but they're planning on it. And then when you see that planning window come and the behavior patterns looking okay. Thanks. No, I'm sorry, at the back. So first I was going to say, uh, as Detroit Lions fan, ticket season holder, they're online learning for them. Or should I just be watching for the You know, we should, we should consider getting into that for a professional learning group, or at least a, at least a support group, right? Uh, serious question. Of the, 20, the 25 different providers in Michigan, uh, online providers, I don't remember saying that exactly. What I would say is, um, as it pertains to online providers, the districts themselves can only put things in the course catalog. But there are a lot of providers that work directly with the school district, and then they never offer it outside of the school district. So there's a lot of those contracts. But as it pertains to a crop and putting things into the catalog, it's actually a relatively small number of ones that are in there. Even though there's like 2,000 courses in that catalog, there's not a whole lot of districts that are putting things into the catalog. So you're correct that your providers, your online providers, are private. Uh, 
distribution to organizations that are, that are in it, you can see that you said the capacity of the districts are not their own providers, or there's other districts in Michigan that have online providers. But I'll give you an example. We have Ontario Virtual High School is an online provider. Um, certain jurisdictions have very robust um, online programs for which we, we solicit the services and we have a consortium of I'm just curious about that online. So, two questions are they privateers? Remember, the two, how are they regulated? How, how are they regulated as far as the information? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the question is really just about what's the relationship between like for profits and this, or, or providers and, and what is in the catalog. Let me give you an example of Michigan Virtual as a way I think to answer that. At Michigan Virtual, we have our own instructional design team, and we design close to 40% of our own courses. So in-house course content creation that creates about 70 to 80% of our courses, but we don't we haven't really to date done a lot in world languages or some of the other ones. So we acquire um, third-party content for several of our courses, the other 60% or so. We use our teachers to teach any, all of those courses. So when you look at the catalog, for instance, it might say, you know, Michigan Virtual is the instructional provider for the virtual, for virtual might be where the content is coming from. So that kind of hybrid can exist. It could exist at a local district too, where the district could say, no, our own teachers created this. Or they could be partnering with another another vendor and said, we got the content from the vendor and we're using our own teachers. Or they could say, we're kind of just a pass through. We've worked out a relationship where the vendor is going to provide the teacher and the content and we're going to take something off the top. And that's more of a GenNet model, a GenSC model, where the third party provider is covering all of those aspects and the local district is more an access component and maybe some streamlining of registration. So it runs the gamut. Thanks. Mm -hmm. we had, oh, I think my question was answered, answered already. Okay. I still set the back of the yeah, I have a question about the pass rates. Yep. Uh, so is that number based on students who took the course, finished the course, and didn't pass it, or is it blue digit wrong? Um, so the way that it works is uh, so the question was about pass rate, how are pass rates calculated? In the effectiveness report, how what you see, uh, and there's a, a, a Really long explanation in there about methodology. So if you're really interested, go in there and look at it. But um, the schools report this data to the state, and when they report this data to the data to the state, there's a field that they have to report on called completion status. And there's like 14 different values that that completion status can have. Completed and passed being one of them, but other ones include things like withdrawn, passing, withdrawn, exiting, these kinds of factors. Um, and we calculate the pass rate by taking the number that had that completed and passed, that's the only thing we count as successful in our metrics, divided by all of the enrollments. So you could recalculate it, you could say, well, should we penalize a school if uh, a child audited it and never intended to get credit for it? Should we penalize a school for a pass rate because um, a child withdrew and exited? Our, our basic concept here is if the state was providing funding to provide that child and the outcome that the state wanted was completely passed, but we put the information in the uh, effectiveness report so that others can, can recompute them if, you, if they wanted to go in a different direction. I'm just curious about the journey with, um, again, I'm not sure what, what Michigan has, but in Ontario, we have different teacher unions, we have different um, other support um, personnel unions as well. So it's quite interesting where you've got teacher, the semester, all of those. What, what was the journey with maybe collective agreements or with teachers, other support staff, and how this is actually uh, being implemented? And again, because you have local districts, it's local districts yep. that have these models, correct? Yes. So, uh, and you've got, you just talked about a bunch of different models, so what kind of impact has that been on, or has there been any impact or discussions with parts of the agreements? Who does what? Is there extra pay? Just curious about that. Yep. So the question asked was about, um, the kind, in particular, how do you deal with kind of contract issues as it pertains between like a mentor and an instructor in a course? Um, lots to say about that. Let me, let me see if I can summarize and not make it too long. 
Uh, when, the, when the legislation first came out, there was a requirement that the mentor also be a, uh, a highly qualified. Schools really resisted that because they felt like they were paying twice for the highly, highly qualified. They had to pay for the teacher to be highly qualified and they had to pay for the mentor to be highly qualified. And so uh, that subsequently went away. That, so that was kind of one of the first unions that like, you know, why, why do both of these, one should be sufficient. And in subsequent revisions that they talked about kind of updating policies, think about that, that went away. And so the, the main practice now really is that most of the mentors are in a paraprofessional role and they're, they're given and they're covered under the contract under that role, and that might be their full time. If there is a teacher who has, uh, and, and there are teachers in some cases that do serve that, they might be on a Schedule B or some other where they get a per enrollment allotment to provide support for that child, so there, there's some other kind of funding that. As it pertains to the teacher load, that it could be that could be a situation where um, it might be different between whether the teacher's responsibilities was to create new content, so they might have a, a particular stipend to actually create the course content, or they might have a release and say instead of teaching something for some, and there, in particular in the states, there's some barter systems where you know we would say I'm going to trade in a teacher, and in, in lieu of getting that teacher, I'm going to get 20 seats or 25 seats in my course. That's not how we work Michigan, but that concept that exists. So they may play it out where if you're going to be teaching this online course, and here's, here's an interesting way to think about it, it might be we're going to offer this course online. We have 25, we have 25 capacity for 25. Five of them we know are interested in their in our own building, and so we're going to put, put those five kids in this teacher's classroom for that day. And the teachers going to support those five face to face, as well as the other twenty that they get in the community. So it, it could be kind of coupled in, and they basically would be that counts as one of their hours that they're providing. Any other last minute, Dirk? Did you? Do you have any uh, data on students uh, seeking out uh, virtual learning over uh, over virtual more visits? What um, I noticed you had a 20 or so percent difference between poverty areas, poverty schools, and not poverty. Are there mechanisms in place that would allow uh, schools with disadvantaged schools to, to receive extra? Is that locally um, supported, or are you having uh, programs uh, invest in that? Um, so the question is a little bit about like enrollment reason. Why are they? Why are the children enrolling? What do we see out of that, and how, how do schools deal with it? Is that kind of the substance of it? Well, I'm, I'm curious. I, I see that I would like to see students uh, searching their own opportunities for learning, and so so is this just sort of a stopgap? Like, okay, now we're going to put you in virtual, or do you have do you have examples of do you share those where? Groups of students have realized that yeah, this is actually a nice way of learning and where we'd like to switch our learning process. Yeah. We have more. Yeah. So um, there is a requirement, uh, it was probably on one of the slides, I just kind of skipped through it and you guys have it later, but if you you have to put a link to the My Courses website on your website. Okay, so there's like an, an expectation that there'll be some communication to parents. Some might put that right on the front page. Others might bury it in 6.5 somewhere, or whatever, in a background color that looks or a color font that looks similar to the background. There is it is all over the map. And in fact, we look at we look each year, we do a study, uh, we look at people's awareness, public awareness and attitudes around online learning. And even though we've had these laws for quite some time, almost less than half the public knows that they exist. And it's really district specific because, as I said, some districts they'll be like, "We're putting all the online catalog in with the, with all the face to You're going to know it all, and you come back and you tell us." And others are like, "You got to pull teeth to let them even know that it exists." Now, I want to I take this ever so slightly because I'm a data guy and it might be of interest. But when we've been tracking the data on why kids go, if you're going because it's a scheduling conflict, or you're going because the course is unavailable locally, you perform really quite well. If you're going because it's a learning preference of the student, it's much less, and if it's credit recovery, it's pretty often. 
So those factors, knowing those kinds of questions, what why is the child getting interested in here, it may help you try to understand the different kinds of conversations that child might need and or the likelihood that they may need support. So in, in terms of support is another example because I've heard some questions about third hour versus others. Some of the mechanisms that people might do is say, you know what, first online course, uh, you're going to be showing up for the first month and you're going to be on site. But I'll tell you what, if you got uh, an 85% or above and you've completed at least a third of the course by then, you can go off site. I'm not going to require you to come to lab. But the moment you drop below 75, 80, whatever, you're going to be back in this lab. And we're going to finish this. Next. So there's ways that they can do different supports to try to entice the children. Sometimes they like to be on their own and do it, and some kids can handle that. Then it reduces the load, and there's still some check ins, but um, they do some interesting things. So how robust is the feedback mechanism between the uh, teacher of record, the teacher who's teaching the content, and out of board students, right, and their guidance people or somebody at their home school? So they get the feedback that, you know, they're not doing well, they're not doing their assignments, you know, they have to walk on each days or a week or seven days. How does that feedback get back to the local support so that they know that they need to part of that student? So there's a couple of so the question is like how does feedback how do feedback lead to these kinds of systems? Um, one there's a variety of them. One is that there's direct messaging. So if at any point an instructor wanted to just reach out to a mentor, they can sign you know send a message to a mentor. Grading policies probably differ between different providers. Usually it's uh, email within 24 hours, grade within 48 hours, and, and it's not infrequent where at least some component of an exam would be graded immediately by the system and the child would know on those and be waiting for a little bit longer for feedback on written up questions. But many systems, many learning management systems, allow uh, and, and providers allow the child or the mentor to log right in and see in real time where the child's at. So for instance, if you were a mentor, you could log in, you could see your students, you could find out when they were last online, you could see their activity, and there's often visual dashboards and things that you can look at, you can see their grade books, you can see what's assigned. So you have that 24-7 in, in, at your fingertips to be able to look at from a particular provider. There's not a statewide aggregate, and so that's where it may be, in some sense, easier for mentors if their students that they're providing are, are, are more nested or clustered within a, one or two providers because they may get used to that system. It's harder if they were dispersed or across 30 different providers. Um, but a lot of learning management systems or student information systems, they're usually in the SIS that bring that information forward to them. And then there's often automated, um, automated newsletters or progress checks at certain points. So at various times of the season, they will get an automatic, automatic update and information about the child back. So are the mentors primarily the proactive well, going in on a regular basis seeing how their students are doing? Or is it mostly reactive waiting for that feedback from the one teacher say the student? The best mentors are making plans with their children about what they need to do moving forward, and then they're confirming that that work was done, and then figuring out what the next plan moving forward is. Okay, closing, Frank. I just want to follow up from her. You, you mentioned that if a student is registering online for uh, scheduling issues, their success rate is pretty good. If they're registering because they have a self-declared interest in doing this, their success rate is actually lower. Yeah. So when you say they're they're registering for self-declared interest, are they doing this in an informed way? Do they know what they're getting into when they're getting into the online and then still not succeeding? Or are they coming in with a preconceived notion which is something I see in my school that online is going to be easier and then they end up dropping it. Yeah. Um, so typically I would say that the scheduled conflict and the course unavailable locally are still issues where the child wants to take that course, right? So if you take if you take one and you put those two aside, if it's not for one of those things and the child still wants to take it, it's typically maybe uh, an avoidance. It's not credit recovery, they have failed it, but they might be just you know wanting to try something else. Uh, I don't have data about can, to break it any further down than that, but I will tell you that is one of the big surprises that we see frequently, which is, wow, this course was harder, or as hard or harder than what my courses are face to are face, face, and I never expected that to be. Okay, Joe, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah.